All right, let's try this again with the screen showing this time. Okay, so we're doing the problem in class exercise one, and we're going to do the state provision first. And what I was just about to say was that I'm going to come up with a blended state rate rather than doing two separate state provisions. Okay, and this is just to kind of speed things along. So in my states, I said I had state number one that had an apportionment rate of 80% and a tax rate of 5%. So my state tax rate for that state is essentially 4%. 4% of my income in total will be taxed in state one, or will result in a tax in, of 4% in state one. And then in state two, I have a 30% apportionment rate and a 10% tax rate so effectively I'm paying a tax rate of 3% in state 2. So my total aggregate state tax rate, when I blend it all together, apportionment rates and tax rates, I get 7% on a blended basis. Okay? So in our example, the state's going to tax the company the same way. It's going to be same taxable income, same temporary item. So you can do this. If the state rules were totally different, then you, know, you couldn't just blend like this. You'd have to do individual calculations. Okay, so let's come up with our um, state provision. Okay, so we're going to do step one. And step one is our current provision. We're going to have PBT of our million. That's one too many zeros. We have PBT of a million. And we have tax-exempt tax interest, bless you, of 50000 That's a perm item. We have an inventory reserve, which is an add-back of 80 because the reserve increased. So that means the books is expensing something that we'll deduct later. And depreciation, we said the book expense was 20 higher than the tax deduction. So that means that our add back of 20 has to be there to get to taxable income. Okay? So that means taxable income is one zero, oops, one zero five zero. Our tax rate is 7%. So 7% of one zero five zero should be 73,500. Okay, so that is our current state provision, okay, step one. Okay, yeah. yeah. now we're on to step two. So step two is our deferreds. We're trying to figure out what our change in our deferred taxes is, right? Our deferreds are going to be driven by our two timing items. Right? So those are going to move over to step two. So I have a future deduction of 80 for my inventory reserve. And in the future, I'm going to have more tax depreciation than books, because this year I had less tax depreciation than books. So in the future, I'm going to have $100,000 of tax deductions that will exceed my book expense. Okay. So times 7%, and I have a DTA of 7,000. Okay. okay, so if I'm doing debits and credits, is my 73.5 a debit or a credit? Credit. All right, let's put that in brackets. Is my 7,000 a debit or a credit? Debit, right? That's an asset. Okay, so if my entry is to credit my payable for 73.5 and debit my DTA for 7, I'm going to have a expense of 66.5, right? That's going to be my provision. Okay? All right, state provision.
We all good with that? All right. Okay, so I'm going to leave that page alone because we're going to need that page in a bit. And the reason is, is we're going to have a federal effect of this, meaning we're going to get to deduct that 73000 right? And in the future, when I save 7000 of state tax, I'm going to get less of a federal deduction in the future. Okay? This is the most confusing part of tonight's class. So I think it's easy for you to understand how we get to deduct the 73 now. We get a federal deduction for the state tax we pay. But if there's always a federal effect to everything that happens for state, if in the future state is going to save tax, that means in the future federal won't get as much of a future deduction as it would otherwise get. Okay? That's a little bit of a mind bender. We'll touch on that in just a second in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's go into our federal calc. So we did our state provision, and now we're doing federal. Okay. Okay, so step one, we're going to do our current provision. So just to shortcut it, we had taxable income that we determined from the states was a million fifty. Right? And the only difference between federal taxable income and state taxable income is the federal deduction for state taxes. So we said that that tax was 735. So we're going to deduct 735 from 1050. Okay, and this is where I don't have the solutions to actually tell me the answer. Do one of you guys have a calculator? Or I can wing it. Oh, that's okay, I'll wing it. 970, uh, yeesh. 976. Okay, and my tax rate is 35%. Definitely not going to do that in my head. So what's that? 341, 775. Okay. Cindy, you can be my designated calculator. How's that? Okay. And so that's my federal tax, right? Am I done? No. No. What do I got to do? Okay. How much is that? 10,000. Okay. So my tax looks like it's 331,775. Okay, am I done now? Yeah. What else do I got to do? What else do you think I need to do? The total liability you need to add the state liability. Um, let's come back to that in a bit. From a federal perspective, I'm done. This is my current provision. Okay, and we'll come back to the FIN 48 issue in a second, too. Okay? So, this is the tax I would owe on my federal return. Right? So, if I'm just worrying about my federal provision, step one. Okay, step two. So, if I think of my deferreds for um, federal purposes, I have my inventory of 80, future deduction of 80, my depreciation, which is my future deduction of 20, and then I have a state tax, right? And this is that 7,000 I was telling you about. So remember that on this page, I created a $7,000 DTA. So, if all things were equal, if I save 7000 of future state tax, that means if I, compared to not having that, I'm going to get 7000 less of a future federal deduction for state taxes down the road. Okay? So, if my company next year makes $100,000, 
but these two deferreds flip, right? If these flip, even though I made $100,000 from a profit perspective, I don't have any taxable income. I didn't pay any state tax. So there's nothing to deduct for federal, right? And I need to anticipate that. Because normally if I was profitable, I'd expect to pay state tax and I'd get a deduction for it. But when these things flip, it's going to cause me to not get the deduction I would expect to have if I was profitable and kind of in normal tax paying mode. But the key is to get in your head that every time something happens for state, if I pay a dollar of tax, I get a federal deduction. If I save a dollar of state tax, I get less of a federal deduction. There's always a federal effect of the payable. There's always a federal effect of the deferred. Okay? A lot of companies, and I'll bet Lee does this, a lot of companies just keep their deferreds net of federal effect. So instead of multiplying them at the 7% um, rate that I've shown here, a lot of companies would just keep that at not 7%, but 65% of 7%. And that just automatically builds in the federal effect of state taxes. Okay? We are not going to do that in this class because doing that is commingling jurisdictions. And that's confusing because now in our state provision, we've introduced a federal effect and it's muddied what we're even doing anyhow. Once you come up with some slick spreadsheet and you can calculate a provision you know, in 30 minutes like Lee can, then you can do whatever you want. But for now, we're going to do states and we're going to keep it totally pure. And then we're going to do federal and keep it separate too. Okay? That is definitely the way to learn. Okay, so I have my future deduction of 80, future deduction of 20, and then future kind of missing deduction. I mean, this is, looks like a taxable temporary difference, but it's just a flip of what happens on the state. Okay, so that's a total future deduction of 93. Um, so 35% of 93, Cindy? 32,550. 32,550, okay. So, so if I'm doing my journal entry, uh, the 331, is that a credit or a debit? 331,775 is a credit to the payable. The 32,550, is that a debit or a credit? It's a debit. We're going to have a DTA. So my balancing amount... Two nine nine two two five. Okay. And that is my provision for federal. If we did it right. Okay. Okay. So, my federal provision was 299, what was that number again? 225. My state provision was 66,500, is that right? Okay, and so that's 365, 725. That's my total provision. All right? We good with that? Okay, so if we're going to do a rate rack, it's going to start getting fun. Okay, so if I'm going to do my rate rack, I'm going to start with my PBT of a million. And I would expect a provision of 350,000, and I'm going to end up with 365,725. Right? Okay, so what are the differences? Megan, what's the difference? R&D credits. 
Okay. That's 10,000. Is that a plus or a minus? A minus. Right? I'm starting with 350 and the 10 makes it go down. Right? Now, what else do I have as a difference? This now. State tax. She picked the hard one. Okay, let's take it step by step. The state tax. So starting with my number of 350000 that assumes no state tax, right? Because that is a federal tax rate. So my state provision of 665 that is an increase in my provision, right? I started with the assumption that I only had federal. I had to pay states. So boom, my rate goes up. Right? All right, what else goes in there? The federal benefit estate tax, right? So if my provision was 66.5, how much in the way of a deduction for Fed am I getting? I'm deducting all 66.5, some through the current and some through the deferred, right? Ultimately, I'm going to take a federal deduction for 66.5. It's just I'm taking 73 now, and I'm going to claw back 7 later. But my federal deduction for my provision is the federal effect of my state provision. Because every dollar of that 66 I pay, I will get a federal deduction for, and not a dollar more or less. It's just very confusing that the state tax happens to not all be in one year. It's spread out into current deferred. So my federal benefit of state, my F boss, is 35% of 65. 23 of 275. 23, 275. Okay, and that's a good guy. Okay, what else? Or does it work? Does it already work? Tax exempt income, right? Tax exempt income. So fifty thousand times thirty five percent is seventeen five, right? And that's a good guy. Tax exempt interest. If you can't read my writing, I I'm stunned. Okay, so if we add all that up, 43, 26, 16, 3, looks like it ties to me. So I think our rate rec works. The state tax payable needs to be added. No, sorry, not state tax, a state provision. The state yeah. provision is right here. That's what that 66 is. Because I just took this number right here, and I said, that's what that 66 is. And then this is just 35% times this. Okay, that's all that is. Sure. So, remember that the definition of the 66, this 66 is, on my million of profits, 66 is the state tax that I will ever pay. Right? I'll pay some now, pay some later, save some later. But over the life of this company, on the million dollars of profit, the 66 represents the cumulative state tax I'll ever pay. We get a federal deduction anytime we have a dollar of state tax. So that means over the life of the company, if we're going to pay 66.5 of state tax, 
means over the life of the company we deduct for federal 66.5 attacks. Okay. And so, if the company didn't have any timing differences, this would be really straightforward. Whatever goes in their payable, you deduct. The payable is the provision. It's very simple. The only difference here is, is instead of just taking an immediate federal deduction for the 66, we're going to deduct in year one 73, and then we're going to add back in year two, seven. So ultimately, we do get a deduction of 66. It just hits our federal payable and our federal deferreds in a way that matches the state payable and the state deferreds. Okay. Admittedly, very confusing. Okay. Okay, how are we doing with that? You doing all right with that? One of the things we were talking about at break is um, we, uh, we put a, a, an extra problem or two out on YouTube last year to um, help reinforce this sort of thing. And I think one of the problems we have is actually from this class last year where we go through the same exact thing of explaining, again, the federal effect of state. So um, Anna, when she sends around the homework and that sort of thing after class, she'll send you that link if, uh, if when she checks it, it's the right problem. So it'll be a way of just kind of getting you to look at another problem and going through it. OK? All right, is there anything I can say out loud that will help you at this point, though? Okay, I'll explain it in a second after we finish the problem, though. Okay, so later on in the problem, the question was, what happens if on the R&D credit, you're only going to win 8 of the 10? You're not going to be able to keep all 10 of the 10. And this is where we were trying to connect kind of all that lecture on FIN48 with the actual problem. Okay, so we just did the provision as if that fact didn't exist. We were assuming that we would win 10. Okay. So what would I change if I was to go back and do my provision with that FIN48 uh, basis in mind? What would I change? Would I change anything in my state provision? No, it's federal credit, right? It didn't have anything to do with states. So my federal provision, what would I change if I thought of the 10 that I claimed, I was only going to be able to keep two? Oh, sorry, I was only able to keep eight, therefore I had a reserve of two. Sorry, I misspoke. What did I do? So Rilla said calculate your provision with just eight. Right? So that's one way to do it. But in reality, the, this account right here, this is going to hit this 331. This is going to hit your tax payable account, right? And you're going to cut a check for three, 331. So the 2,000 that you might owe, that extra 2,000, that's probably going to a non-current tax payable. So you could certainly do your provision again with the eight in here. And this, is, this number is going to jump up to 333.775. But the incremental entry you're effectively accru recruiting is you're going to make the, the payable, the non-current liability, go up by 2,000. And your provision is likewise going to go up by 2,000. Right? Because this number goes up by two, this number goes up by two. 
It's just a perm item, right? Perm item affects your payable, affects your provision. And if you increased your provision by two on the federal side, if this becomes 301225, then this is going to become 367725, which will change this which means this needs to go to 8. Okay. That's what adding a FIN48 assumption would do. It would just overlay what you already did. You would just go in and adjust the things that you reflected in your provision as filed, and you would, you would apply your FIN48 assumptions on top of that. The, the incremental journal entry that I would book for that reserve would be a credit to non-current liability of two. There's no deferreds, so my step one is to come up with my payable. There is no step two, there's no deferreds. So then my step three is to come up with my provision to balance my entry so I would debit provision for two. Yeah, you call it non-current liability. Okay, but what I wanted you to see with adding that FIN48 assumption is it changes your payable, it changes your provision, it changes your rate rack. Okay. Okay, so that problem falls into the fairly straightforward category of problems kind of after you get past the first couple classes, but that problem ran us like an hour to kind of have you guys go through it and then us review it together. So you can see how time goes by quickly, or at least it seems to me it goes by quickly when we're doing problems um, compared to when I'm just talking and you have to listen to me. So um, as the problems get harder, you'll see that we just kind of, time just gets sucked up with this stuff. Um, it just takes time to, to actually run through all the calculations, especially if you have multiple jurisdictions. You start adding a bunch of assumptions to it, and the volume, just it just takes time to go through it. So as you start thinking about like how the exam is going to work, if we have multiple problems like this, which the answer is yes, we have multiple problems like this, um, you have to kind of figure out how to do it in a fast enough sort of way to actually get through the exam. And I can't remember if I've already mentioned this, but I will say this, that every year I have to like physically extract an exam from at least one student because they like don't want to leave. <laughs> and uh, the best was last year. And uh, last year there were two students that wouldn't hand me their exam. And I told them, I'm like, I'm going to walk towards you now and I'm going to take your exam. And, uh, and then when I got up to him, I was like, I'm going to reach for it now. I'm going to take your exam. <laughs> and um, one woman... She uh, she was working on her exam, and as I told her I was reaching for it, she just pulled it close. <laughs> so then I walked over to the next woman, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to take your exam. She handed it to me and cried. And I was like, unbelievable. <laughs> and then, I, then the other woman gave me her exam. So, yeah, so don't make me do that. <laughs> That's awful. Um, but I, I, I say that in a half-joking sort of way, but you can see as you're doing these problems, it can really just consume you, you know? It can really just take a long time. So practice, right? We had two in-class exercises tonight. We only made it through one. We're still going to cover some other material, but we're not going to get through the other problem. So I absolutely want you to do that other problem as more homework, because um, the more you practice these problems, the better you'll be at it, without a doubt. Okay? So... Rilla had asked a question about, um, explain this whole lag method thing. Okay. So let me explain how the lag method would change this answer. So again, our state provision, we paid 73000 on our current state returns, 
and then we have a 7,000 DTA. Okay? If we're on a lag method for, for taking a federal deduction for state taxes, when do we get this 73,500 deduction? Next year. Okay? So if I go to my federal provision, right, I'm not going to take this federal deduction now. That's not going to hit my current provision. But instead, I'm going to have another, you know, state tax deduction of 73.5. I'm going to have another federal deferred. So instead of reducing my payable, which is a debit to the payable in effect, because I'm owing less tax, I'm going to book a debit in my deferred tax asset, because in the future I'll save that tax. So it is merely shifting this deduction over here. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay. In reality, some states are cause you to be on a lag method deduction. Other states allow you to be on a current deduction for federal. So the answer is like some of both in reality. It gets really messy. Um, but state taxes tends to be kind of small, especially for big high tech companies that are largely offshore. And so state taxes becomes kind of a rounding thing, honestly. Um, but when, whenever we do problems, we'll either be all lag or all current. We're not going to be mixing it up and making your life hard like that. Okay. Does that make sense? So when you get the solutions from Anna and you look at the solutions to the problem we just did, it'll be on the lag method. And I'm sure, I mean, the formatting of the way the solution works is different than the scribbling on my page. So go back to the problem, try to figure it out on a lag method. Right? One thing that you'll see is when we go through problems in class and I go through the solutions, I, I almost never show it the same way the solution shows it. And I guess it's just... I don't think I wrote the solutions, and so it's just not the way I think, but it's fine. You can get to the same answer many different ways, okay? Um, and so use that to your advantage of, gosh, I have to understand it like both ways, not like I'm frustrated because it doesn't follow a perfect script, okay? All right, that's, that's it for the problem. Okay. So the other thing I want to cover in class tonight, um, like I said, we're not going to hit we're not going to hit the second problem. So I want you to do that one as homework. Um, but I want to talk about valuation allowances for I don't know 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> so valuation allowances, of all the things you'll read in ASC 740, valuation allowances is kind of the one that makes the most sense. It's pretty logical, right? All valuation allowance is, is a contra asset, right? So in your accounting classes, like back to basically beginning accounting, where they talk about contra asset accounts, they talk about um, a gross asset, and then they say, look, there's something about that asset that makes you think that the value of it is not its carrying value, right? The fair value of whatever the carrying value is seems to misrepresent the, the true value of that asset from a fair value perspective. So the contra asset is there to take your net, net asset down to what is a more realistic amount, right? So like I said, um, you know, I think it was in class one we were talking about this. You take accounts receivable. A bad debt reserve is just a contra asset for accounts receivable. A customer might owe you 100 bucks, but if the more likely outcome is they're not going to pay you 100, it's going to be something less than that, that you book a reserve, a bad debt reserve, as a contra asset to the accounts receivable balance. If you have an inventory balance of $50, but you think some of the inventory is bad, you book an inventory reserve to reduce the inventory down to its, you know, a more appropriate value, a realizable value. A deferred tax asset, you know, you might have an NOL of $100, but... If you don't think you're profitable and you're never going to need the 100, there's no use telling the reader that you have an asset of 100 because an asset means that there's value to the company. And an NOL to a company that loses money every year, it's not really worth anything. It's not, a, it's not an asset that a company can convert to cash and turn into something really valuable. So a valuation allowance is just it's the same contra asset account 
that you see in the rest of the balance sheet, but it's just specific to taxes. Okay? So anytime you have a deferred tax asset, you need to look and decide, is that deferred tax asset something that this company can use? Right? And what Lee was saying with California is that <clears throat> she has excess California R&D credits. Right? And when California changed its law, it, it causes most companies not to pay very much California tax, and then they have this very generous R&D credit. So, you know, my guess is if you took like the top 50 uh, high-tech companies in the Valley, that their California tax was less than their California credits. So imagine if on like your individual income tax return, you got a credit for more than your tax every year, so you didn't pay any tax. And that's how it was every year, every year of year. I mean, that would be awesome, right? That's how it is for most California companies. They don't pay California tax. And in fact, they have even more credits than they need, and they just carry them forward to the next year because California R&D credits carry forward forever. They don't even expire. So that's wild, right? You have this mounting pile of credits that can offset tax, and then next year you have even more credits than you need. And so it's one of those things where, like, you're never going to pay tax. So even profitable companies like a NetApp would say, well, I can't really book a deferred tax asset for these California credits I keep getting that I don't really even need anymore. It's like too much. So they book a valuation allowance against it. And all they're saying is, yeah, I have this credit, but it doesn't mean no good, right? And you as the reader of a financial statement, you shouldn't look at that credit as some kind of good thing to me because I don't even need it. I mean, it's silly, it's useless. But it is a deferred tax asset. So, so you see deferred tax assets or valuation allowances in funny cases, right? I mean, sometimes it's exactly what you'd expect. It's, it's AMD, they lose money, they've lost money for a long time, they have a valuation allowance, which basically says the very obvious thing of, I'm not making money, so you shouldn't count on me making money, and my NOLs don't really do us any good unless we're making money and we need to use them. Like, that's a very obvious and common sense application of a valuation allowance. But when you kind of switch to a net app where they're profitable, they're paying tax, and you kind of think, wow, that, why would they have it? And they have one because of this very kind of unique situation. And so the, the takeaway from that is, you know, you need to look at every company and figure out what its deferred assets are because even for companies you wouldn't expect to have a valuation allowance, maybe the, the unique characteristics of a certain type of deferred asset will cause them to have a valuation allowance, right? And... You know, when you look at um, Intuit in next week's reading, I mean, Intuit is a cash cow. I mean, they print out, or they program TurboTax, you guys buy it, they make just tons of money. I mean, that is their business model. And they're very profitable, they pay a lot of tax, but they have valuation allowances. And so you should look and figure out why. Why do they have valuation allowances? That's wild, right? You would never expect a company that's so routinely and consistently profitable to need a valuation allowance. Okay. <clears throat> so um, these sorts of questions that I have on the slide here, I mean, these are the things you should ask when you look at companies' um, 10Ks. Um, usually companies are pretty good at explaining why they have a valuation allowance, especially for companies that are profitable, where it's just not so obvious. Um, I think... Intuit has a disclosure pretty similar to what NetApps is, where they describe in a paragraph not only what the valuation allowance is, but kind of what it relates to. Um, and so I think it should be pretty easy to follow. Okay, so you need a valuation allowance when your deferred tax asset is not more likely than not to be realized. Okay? So you need to look at your deferred asset and say, is there a 51% chance or greater that I will, I will use that deferred asset? That is the question, right? And that's tough to figure out because you're kind of forecasting the future. So the answer is going to depend, the answer about whether, what the likelihood of you realizing the deferred asset is, it's going to depend on all the facts and circumstances, all, the, all what's called positive and negative evidence. And, and my, we'll hit that in a few minutes in terms of examples of what that evidence is. Um, 
this is a biggie, this last bullet. So facts should be well documented since this is a judgment thing. And uh, boy, that could not be more true um, because I mean, the way the big four auto firms work, the, the big four auto firms are regulated by the PCOB. And the PCOB was created out of um, the whole Sarbanes-Oxley Enron um, legislation. And the PCOB comes and they audit the uh, big four auto firms' audits. And they look and they say, did you audit? You know, did you do a good job auditing? And there's two areas that they, uh, they look at the most in taxes. This is one of them. And so audit firms get a lot of pressure from the PCOB to, to see how they audited a company's conclusion that they did or didn't need evaluation allowance. And the reason that PCOB picks on it is it's judgment-based. Okay. PCOB is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And again, it's a government reg uh, regulatory body that um, comes and audits the firms and then issues reports that are publicly available saying whether the firms are any good or not. And uh, for the most part, they've give, given reports that say the firms are not doing a good job. And um, I mean, the, the issue is a very practical matter is the standard is very high, like I kind of talked about when we were discussing things with Lee. And so if you're looking for one thing wrong with an audit, you know, it's not that hard to find one thing wrong with an audit. You know, when you do your provision problem in your exam, if I want to find one thing wrong with your provision problem, it's probably not that hard. But you might have gotten 95% of it right, right, and feel pretty good about it. Um, but when you're inspected like that, that's, those are the types of things that pop up. And of course, when the, when the firms take heat because we're not doing a good job auditing valuation allowance uh, analyses, then we go back to the companies and we're like, all right, well, you better write a whole bunch of memos and give us a whole bunch of analysis and do all this stuff to give us you know, an audit trail for our files. And then the companies are like, hey, this is no good. We don't like this. You guys are being mean. And I mean, that's, it's like a trickle down thing, right? That's what's happening. All right, well, anyways, that's the two cents on documentation. So if we're thinking of that account um, journal entry schedule that we've been using, um, evaluation allowance would slip into the deferred tax column. And does evaluation allowance affect my provision or not, if you're thinking about step one, two, and three? Yes or no? Way does evaluation allowance change affect my provision? Definitely does, right? If I'm a company that um, has a uh, NOL of a hundred dollars and a DTA of thirty-five sitting on its books, and then let's say suddenly I decide, you know what, I need evaluation allowance on that thing. I don't think it's any good. If I go through step one, two, three, step one is what's the effect of my payable? The effect of my payable is none. I'm not a taxpayer. Step two is what's the effect of my deferred? My deferred just went from 35 to zero. Right? I essentially wrote off my deferreds by booking this contra asset. So I have to credit my deferred tax balance by 35. So the debit entry, the balancing entry, is provision. Okay. I'm writing off an asset, and that credit to my asset has to be balanced with a debit to expense. So when you see a loss company that has a full valuation allowance, its rate rec is very simple. Right? <clears throat> so if you saw a loss company with a val uh, valuation allowance, you might expect them to see, you know, PBT of 100. I would expect a 35 benefit if it was a loss. But I have a VA, which offsets that. So I have a zero provision. I have no payable. I have no debt deferred. I have no expense. So that means on my loss of 100, even though I would have expected a benefit, the valuation allowance nullifies that. So I end up with no provision benefit on a loss. Right? So evaluation allowance hurts your rate when it's being set up, and it helps your rate when it's being released. Right? If you suddenly, if you had a valuation allowance, if you were AMD and 
and you were, you know, had all these NOLs and you had this valuation allowance, and then all of a sudden Intel decides, you know what, we're not going to make chips anymore. We're just super, super tired of that. And AMD's like, this is the greatest thing ever. We're going to be able to sell chips at higher prices, make money. Then they might release their valuation allowance and be like, man, you know, this asset's going to be great for us because we're going to be able to offset our future tax. They would debit asset for the DTA and credit provision. So it works the other way. Okay, the key in this slide is this. So, future realization of the tax benefit of the DTA depends on the right kind of income at the right time. Okay? So, you need to have the right character, right? So, like if you had a capital loss carry forward, you got to have capital gain income. If you have you know, a foreign tax credit carry forward. Well, that only carries for ten carries forward for ten years. So, in the next ten years, you better figure out a way to use your foreign tax credit carry forward, because if I'm using it in year fifteen, that's not going to help. Right? And this is tricky because when you start getting into state attributes and different credits and NOLs and NOLs from some years of carry forward periods that are different than other NOLs. I mean, you got to track when all this stuff expires and whether or not you're going to use it or not, right? But remember, you need the right type of income at the right time, okay? And so if you have a DTA, some companies this is going to be really obvious, right? If you're into it and, you know, you happen to have a, a DTA for a bad debt reserve, like in the future you'll get a deduction for bad debts, the question of whether or not you're going to be able to use that I mean, you don't even really need to ask yourself. It's just so obvious, right? They make so much money that when that deduction rolls in, of course they'll use it. I mean, it's, it's just not even a conversation worth having. But, but for other companies, it just depends on the facts. You look at a DTA and you got to think, well, am I going to use it or not, right? I got to be sure, or at least I got to be 51% sure. Okay. So here's the bit about positive and negative evidence, okay? We got to look at positive and negative evidence to figure out what the answers are. And there's basically four sources of income, okay, this is important. There's four sources of income that can be used to realize a DTA. And so anytime you have a DTA, you got to go through these four sources and figure out if you're more likely than not to have the right type of income out of these four sources at the right time. You don't need all four of these, you just need one. Okay? So the four sources as it's described in the ASC 740 is one, carry back. So if you had an NOL one year and you knew you could carry it back, then boom, you can definitely realize it, right? There's no question. You just carry it back to last year. That income's there. I mean, there's no forecasting or judgment. or It's very mechanical. So if you have the ability to carry back a loss, then your valuation allowance inquiry, that's over. Right? That's easy. Future reversals of taxable temp differences. Okay, so let's say that you had depreciation differences where... You've claimed bonus depreciation for tax, and in the future, you're going to have a lot less tax deductions because you've already deducted the assets. Okay? So if you had something where, let's say the book basis of your truck was uh, 10, and your tax basis of it was 4, you have a taxable temporary difference of 6. If you expect that six to reverse in the future, well then you can offset your NOLs or your other DTAs that are going to reverse at that same time. All right? So DTLs you have that net with DTAs, meaning that they reverse at the same time, that's a source of income for you to book DTAs. Okay? So if AMD had a lot of NOLs and they said, I'm not sure that I can use them, well they could use them to the extent of six as long as we thought that six would reverse before the NOLs expired. 
if the NOLs expired next year, because they're really old NOLs, but we didn't think the depreciation on this truck would reverse for a few years, then you can't net them, right? Because logically, they don't offset each other. So when you net deferred liabilities and assets, you got to be careful that actually, as a matter of law, the two things would offset. Okay? People get tricked by this a lot. Um, and in the homework, I think it is, we talk about a little bit of a trick question on when that netting can be a problem. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, so the second source of income is reversals of taxable temporary differences. Pretty much everyone has this, right? This is very common. So you look at companies that have valuation allowances, the first thing they do is they look at what DTLs they have. And they figure out if those things are going to be able to wash out some of the DTA. Okay, third, so now we're getting into the um, area where it's grayer, right? Because above this line, these things are just factual. You either have them or you don't. Below that line, like number three, future income. Well, you might think you're going to have future income, but there's hoping you have future income, and then there's having future income, right? So whether or not you count your forecast of future income just depends upon the credibility of that forecast, right? So if you're into it and you said, you know what, I've had income for the last like three decades and it was uninterrupted and it's growing every year and it's very stable and every April 15th people buy our software, then if they say, you know what, I think I'm going to be profitable next year, you're like, I think you're right, right? I feel like that's a pretty credible assumption. But if you're AMD and you're like, you know, I know I've lost money for three decades and I think next year's the year and I'm telling you, I feel good, right? You're going to think, I don't know, right? I'm not so sure. So you'll be skeptical. And that's the same way auditors will react if you say I'm relying on source number three as my reason for not having a valuation allowance. They'll say, all right, well, let's look at like what happened before. Let's look at like the strength of the forecast. Let's look at why we believe one or the other. And the issue that very commonly comes up is um, your history is fact. Right? Your forecast is not. So when you think of positive and negative evidence, things that are factual, things that are verifiable, things that, you know, are not based upon your hopes and dreams and optimism, those are the things that auditors are going to lean more heavily towards because, again, I mean, they're real, right? And it's not that the audit firms don't believe your forecast per se, but, you know, they're trying to audit based upon the most kind of auditable information that exists, right? And that tends to be the real facts. So three can be tricky. I mean, that's usually where all the debate is is around item number three. Okay, and number four is planning strategies. So if you said, um, you know, gosh, I'm not going to let my NOLs expire. I'll, um, you know, I'll sell the whole land and building that I own for my corporate campus before I let my NOLs expire. And that thing's really appreciated. My book value doesn't reflect it, but, you know, it's in Silicon Valley and the real estate prices are up and I'll, I swear I'll sell my campus, I'll book a big gain and I'll use my NOLs. Like, that would be a planning strategy. I mean, that seems pretty uh, dramatic, though, right? If a company came to an audit firm and said, I'm going to sell my campus in order to use my NOLs, your next question is like, well, where are you going to work? <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that seems like a pretty complicated strategy, meaning not from a tax perspective. It seems very straightforward from a tax perspective, but that's complex in terms of disruptive to your business operation, and then people might be skeptical you'd really do it. So the planning strategy has to be real, it has to be something you'd represent you do, the cost of it have to make sense, and there's just kind of a, you know, a, a smell test that goes along with planning strategies. And I would say rarely do you see companies rely on number four as a source of income for their valuation allowance. It's talked about, but rarely do people rely on that, very rarely. But, but ironically, the rule is you have to consider it. So you couldn't, 
you couldn't say I have this NOL and I have this very obvious planning strategy, but I'm not considering it and I'm just lazy and I don't want to think that hard. Um, if there was something that was just so straightforward that everyone would do it, you absolutely have to consider it as part of the analysis. Okay, so I think we just talked about all four of those pretty, pretty extensively. So just to highlight a few things, this comes up all the time. The number one um, kind of perception issue with valuation allowances is easily this. So some of you will have heard of what's called the three-year test. And the three-year test is if I look at my current year plus my two prior years, if the aggregate of those three periods is a loss, then I have three years of losses. And, and when FAS 109 was drafted decades ago, in the exposure draft, which is when the FASB releases something for comments before it's finalized, they included a three-year test in there. And um, they were trying to draw a, a bright line on, gosh, if you have this fact, meaning three years of losses, maybe we should just assume that you have to have a valuation allowance. And then they removed that from the actual FAS 109 guidance. That didn't come out. But oddly enough, people adopted that in a really practical way as a as almost a de facto rule. So if you're working out at a company and the valuation allowance issue is uh, top of mind, I guarantee you one of the first things people will ask is, what's your three-year test? Um, extremely common that people look to that. Okay, And the three-year test is current year plus two prior years. And although it's not a black and white, a black and white line test in ASC 740, it's pretty close to applied that way in practice. And just because you have three years of losses doesn't mean you have to have a valuation allowance, but boy, the, 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 you know, it's uphill, if that's your facts, to not having a valuation allowance. It can be done, but it's definitely uphill. Okay? But I guarantee you the first thing the audit firms will look at is that three-year test. You know, I think this negative evidence, positive evidence thing is pretty straightforward. But if I were you, the things I would remember are, um, remember the stuff I said about the, the facts versus the forecast and the judgment, differentiating what's real and factual and verifiable versus what's a forecast and judgment, that's a, that's a big distinction. And then knowing that the three-year test is very prolific, but it's not actually the end of the day, uh, you know, end the answer. Those are probably the two key things on valuation allowances. Okay. So these are our, this is kind of the summary of what we just learned. So all DTAs, you need to think about whether you'll use them. If you're not more likely than not, you put a valuation allowance on. You got to have the right amount of income or the right character at the right time. Sometimes you got to schedule things out, like when are assets and liabilities reversing. Just like every aspect of the provision, this is done jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And uh, do your audit firm a favor and make your documentation really clear. Okay, so we would have done problem two, but no way you guys are staying till 11 o'clock at night with me. So for next week, um, more reading, read into it and do homework assignment number three. Okay? So when Anna sends out the materials, if we have an extra class problem that we've done on YouTube, um, check that out. Also do the second in-class exercise from tonight. Do that for homework. And depending on kind of how you guys feel about either that second in-class exercise or the homework for t from tonight, if we want to do one of those problems in class next week, we can do that. That's fine. Um, but we're going to keep doing more and more of these problems. Okay. That's it.